All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 24th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2024. Huh, how about that? Uh, <clears throat> give me a pause there. All right, so, uh, you know, I've, I've done some videos on Christianity as a relationship, not a religion, and that is absolutely true. I think that's one of the biggest problems for people is that they look at this thing called Christianity in the United States or in the world, and they see this institution that calls itself Christianity. Uh, these denominations, uh, the biggest of which is Roman Catholicism. I mean, one and, you know, half of Christianity is that. Is that real Christianity? Is that the Christianity established by Jesus Christ and his apostles? Is that what we find in the New Testament? Absolutely not. What do we find in the New Testament? A relationship with God through Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with a personal God. Um, that uh, Lutheran minister, LCMS minister, um, what, Brian Wolf Mueller? Well, arguing that it's a religion, not a relationship. Well, why does he do that? Because he does not know Christ. He does not know that God. Oh, doesn't know him. And that's the problem. He's, he has religion, but he doesn't have a living relationship with Christ, or he would never have done that video arguing that Christianity is not a relationship. And going off into some extremes like the the uh, Jesus is my boyfriend kind of fad stuff. He simply, he would never talk about his other things that way. It's, it's not a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of actually having the relationship with Christ, with God in Christ. And sometimes I get some weird criticisms. I think it's weird. Uh, people have, I've mentioned going for a walk with God and they say, that's crazy. And I said, well, wait a minute, if, if Christ dwells in me, and I'm talking about Christians that supposedly believe the believe theology, uh, is not Christ in us? And how can I go for, is not God in us, in his spirit? Then how can I go for, for a walk without God? I can't do anything without God. How can I do it? He dwells in me. I'm, or don't you believe that? See, there's people that they have the religion. They have the doctrines, but they don't have the reality. See, you could, you could know, you could have sound doctrine. You, you can have all the theology in the world and not have Christ because it's a personal relationship with God in Christ. It's the only kind of Christianity that's real. Without that, it is not true Christianity. And I'll demonstrate that for you from the Scripture here simply. It's pretty easy to do. I mean, just read the New Testament. If you think that's a religious system, well, you come from a religious system, and you're looking at that, and you're seeing it. You're like a Roman Catholic that somehow managed to see transubstantiation in the New Testament, and the Roman Catholic Mass in Latin in the New Testament. <laughs> I mean, these people that are fussing about whether the Mass should be in Latin or in the common language is like, what are you? They're talking about religion. The, 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 uh, the Mass or the Lord's Supper or communion is supposed to be all about him and your relationship with him and your brothers and sisters in Christ. And they've turned it into a system of religion. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 17. And this has to do with the Apostle Paul here. Uh, He's in Athens. He's waiting there for, I believe it's uh, Timothy to show up. 
And while he's there, he's walking around the city and sees all their idols. And he also is uh, uh, brought by, he's, he begins to preach rents a spot, I think it is, in the, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to go into this whole thing. So he's reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those ha who happen to be present. So apparently he went down to the, the market, the shambles, um, a flea market is down in Texas. We used to have those down the Mexican border uh, as sort of an impromptu place where you could rent spots, uh, farmers markets, same kind of thing. And he's so he's he's proclaiming Christ in the midst of Athens, and they bring him. Some of the people took him and brought him to the Areopagus, uh, sort of like the the center where philosophers philosophized, where where people spoke about these things. And he's uh, they so they said to him, this is verse nineteen of of Acts 17, we know, uh, may we know what this new teaching is that you are proclaiming. For are you, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Some novel ideas. Verse 21, now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend all their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Well, that's what we do in the United States today. It's called social media and YouTube. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So they were religious, they were worshiping gods, and they were so religious that they had an idol to a God they didn't even know his name. So to an unknown God, therefore what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Yes, the God of the scriptures was an unknown God to the Athenians. Not that they didn't know he existed. They just didn't know him. They had no name for him. They knew there was a creator. Everyone knows there's a creator. As Paul mentions in Romans chapter 1. What, you there, uh, what therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you that the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by human hands. Made with hands. Does not dwell in buildings made by human beings. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. So next time you are in church and they pass the offering plate, don't be fooled that you're giving something to God. He does not need it. God does not need your money. The institutional church, the building, the grounds, the mortgage, the utilities, the salaries, that needs it. God doesn't need it. Since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one, that's Adam, all every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations. That they should seek God. Well, this right here, by the way, is a denial of Calvinism. Uh, Calvinists don't read the Bible. They just read their theology and insert it into the Scripture. They take out pieces of the Bible and pound it into their, their doctrine. They're not the only one that does this, by the way. They're just very annoying when they do it. That they should seek God. So God made everyone, and the, he, he, he determined their appointed times and boundaries, that in order that they should seek God. 
if perhaps they might grope for him, because they're in the dark, and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your poets have said, for we are his offspring. Adam was called the son of God, but Adam was created by God, and then God, a person, personal creation, by the way, if you remember, or maybe if you, you haven't read Genesis, but everything else, God just said, let it be. When it came to man, he formed man out of the dust of the earth and then personally breathed the breath of life into him, and man became a living soul. So he got his hands dirty, making Adam, personally made Adam. And Adam was made to be the image of God. Which comes, there's problems with that, but I personally don't think, this is my personal opinion, that Adam and Eve, uh, in that state that they are in Genesis, are not fully mature and fully in the image of God. There was a tree in the garden that they had not eaten of, and it's a tree of life. And to eat of that tree, they would become immortal, incapable of dying. And they were allowed to eat of that tree. It was only after they had sinned that they were not allowed to eat of the tree of life. And we see that tree reappear at the end of the book of Revelation. So what was that? You had a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life. And they had a choice. God warned them, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. The other tree was to live. They chose the wrong tree. And passed that on to us. Uh, there's a lot of bad teaching about so-called original sin. It's a the, the word sin actually means, uh, the primary meaning is a lack of, a lack of something, a lack of God. See, the, 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 the original sin that we have is that we're born without God in us because of Adam's sin. Adam and Eve died when they ate of that tree, died spiritually. They were cut off from God. That relationship that is necessary for human beings to be the image of God, which is what we were created to be, God must be in us or we cannot possibly be his image. Jesus Christ said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He was the perfect image of God and is. And that's what we're called to be, the perfect image of God, Christ in us. With him in us, we are restored to God's purpose. Without him in us, we have an identity crisis, a serious identity crisis. Let me go to that for a little bit here. The reason people spend their lives trying to find themselves is because they don't have Christ in them. You are not what you were created to be. You were created to be the image of God. And without that, you cannot possibly find your purpose to exist. He is your reason to be. And you can only find the meaning of life in him. Jesus said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. When we surrender ourselves to Christ, when we are reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ and turn our lives over to him, we are, in a sense, we are losing our individual identity in a way our individual identity as, as sinners, as autonomous rebels against God. We give that up. We hand ourselves over to him. And he makes a new creation in us. He restores us to what we were supposed to be, which was lost in the garden. So when you hear preachers say that, that we're all the image of God, they're wrong. They're wrong. Um, a person that hasn't been reconciled with God, a person that hasn't been born again, a person that, in whom Christ is not really dwelling, can't claim to be the image of God. Because you're not. 
And even then, our flesh is not the image of God because our bodies have not yet been redeemed. The, our body still bears the, bears the image of Adam. But the new creation in us, that, that, which when Jesus said, you must be born again, you must be born from above, you must be born of the Spirit. Well, that doesn't sin. That is in the image of God, in the image of Christ. It's just, it's, it's, it's concealed behind this body of clay. Just like Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, but he was concealed in a human wrapping, which is a crude way to say it, but it, he is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And we are, Adam was called to be that too. But he never got that far. Christ came and, and fulfills that, and in him, he is the, the not only the reconciliation of human beings and the restoration of what we're supposed to be, but in him is the reconciliation of all things, God putting creation back into its proper order. So if you want to save the planet, believe in Jesus Christ, because he's coming to save the planet. Truly. There is going to be a great reset. It's just not what the people at Davos and Soros think it is. It is the return of Jesus Christ, which he comes to put everything back in its proper place to restore the damage that was done by Satan and Adam. And we find it here in Athens where they're worshiping an unknown god. So he made uh, from one, from Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So God does determine some things, but he doesn't say he determines everything. You have to remember that. There is human freedom because we were created to be the image of God. We are in bondage to sin but even a slave can shake his chains, and a slave can cry out to God. We are, not, we are not dead, totally dead. Even Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they still, God still spoke to them, and they heard him speak. So don't drink the Calvinist Kool-Aid. They take things way too far, way too far. It's a system of theology. It's not Christianity. It's a huge difference. That's what I want to talk about here, what real Christianity is, because there's, there's all kinds of people out there who have rejected Christianity. But it's not what Jesus came to bring us. They've rejected man-made religion, man-made things they call Christianity. Just like this idol that was to an unknown God. It was made by human hands. And so is the vast majority of what calls itself Christianity today. Starting with the biggest one, which is Rome, Roman Catholicism. It's a man-made religious system. It is not Christianity, not true New Testament Christianity, not what Jesus and the apostles proclaim to us. It is a parody of real Christianity, a satanic parody of it. And that's true about all religious denominations. They are a parody, to one degree or another, of what Christianity is supposed to be, which is a real living relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, as Paul says. If that's not a personal relationship, what can be? How can you have a more intimate relationship with God than God in you? Truly. It's not something you're born with. You have to be born again to have it. So he, that they should seek for God. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him. See, this is talking about the, the Gentiles that God had not revealed himself to, other than in creation. Though he's not far from each one of us, for in him we live and have our, uh, and, and exist, have our being, even as some of your own poets have sat, for we are his offspring. So the, the, the Greeks had a certain rudimentary knowledge of God. Everyone has. And then they create false gods like Zeus and, and uh, 
Aphrodite and Hermes and all those other things that were false human ideas for making gods in our own image. That's, that's what they were. They were, oh, how would you say, that? exaggerations of human beings with all human, all the human problems and sin. They're just bigger, just bigger and more powerful. You know, it's like human beings like that, too. They're just, it's what happens when human beings get too much power. They, they act like the Greek gods, which is bad. They had every vice that human beings have. It's hardly something you can worship. And they really weren't worshipped. The pagan worships, they, they simply worship the deities to try to get their aid to get what they want. That's what it is. That's sort of the religion I grew up in, in a way. I would pray, but I wanted God to do my will. I wanted God to help me. I wanted, I wanted something, and I wanted God to give it to me or help me get it. How many people out there pray like that? I know you do. I know you do. Or you have done it, done that. You're not praying as a as a worshiper of God. Because then you you say what Jesus said, thy will be done on earth in my life too as it is in heaven. No, that's one way you you can tell if people really love God or not is well, how do they pray? Do they pray for God's will to be done or do they pray for their will to be done? Yeah, that that is one sign. It's not the only sign. It's not a definitive sign, but definitely because you can. But I think only a true Christian can pray that from their heart and mean it. Everybody can repeat the Lord's Prayer. But can you say it and truly mean it that you want God's will done, even in you? That demonstrates that you're, you're, you've submitted yourself to him. That indeed he is your Lord and Savior. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature as like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Roman Catholicism, the world's biggest religious system, Look at St. Peter's. All of that grandeur and splendor and sensual beauty, it's all made by man. It's to the glory of man. It is not to the glory of God. Because it's all shaped by human skills. In the Old Testament, God said of the, the stones of the altar, they must not be cut. They must not be shaped by human hands. Why? Because you cannot worship God with human works. No. Worshiping God is recognizing who God is above all else and recognizing your relationship to that, to him. And being in that relationship that he has ordained for us, that is true worship. And walking with him, that is true worship. Being what he wants us to be. That is how you really worship God. He could care less about money. You could give him... You know, it's like Bill Gates. He can give God a five trillion billion dollars. Would God? You know, you could not buy anything from God. You can't buy a blessing from God. You can buy a blessing from the Catholic Church. You can buy a mass. I know you can. They sell those things. My father-in-law bought me one, and I, I, I respected him for it. I, but. The thought, it's the thought that counts, but nevertheless, it had nothing to it. It was no, rea there was no reality there. There was no reality there. It was all religion. It was a, a parody of Christianity. It was a distortion of Christianity. It's what happens when God gives us the truth and 2,000 years pass, man twisting it to their own ends 
and according to their own imagination. And that after uh, Rome is probably one of the worst because it's it's been in that process for so long. And the process of Rome, of that corruption, ends up with Pope Francis, who is a non-Christian, completely. There's no way <laughs> he has zero connection with the New Testament. Well, if you're not born again, you have zero connection with Jesus Christ. So you have to be born again to be in the kingdom of God, to, to behold the kingdom of God. You cannot be part of it without that. God has to create a new life in you. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That is, Andy Stanley was actually correct when he talked about the resurrection. Yes, that is the proof that God has given to everyone that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that God sent, the one that died for our sins and rose again. The resurrection actually proves that Jesus Christ accomplished that too, that he bore our sins, atoned for them fully, otherwise he would not have been able to rise from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we will hear uh, you again concerning this. And some men joined him and believed among them uh, whom were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Deramus, and others with them. So some believed. And Paul's practice was, those that didn't believe, okay, those that did, he'd gather them and establish a community, an ecclesia, those who are called out by God out from the world, and gathered them together as followers of Christ. See, the church in Athens are all those who belong to Jesus Christ in Athens. Who you belong to determines what you are. If you're a true Christian, you belong to Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Lutheran. Well, then you don't belong to Jesus Christ. If you belong to a religious system, that's not the same as belonging to Jesus Christ. Now, you can be a Lutheran, you can belong to a religious system and belong to Christ. But Christ is your identity. He is your life. That other stuff is just man-made religion and a building to gather in, and nothing more, nothing more. See, none of this theology here, none of this stuff, and there's more shelves around here of that. None of that can give you life at all. I mean, you can read one of the better ones, uh, Bovink's Reform Dogmatics. Or, let's see, another one's halfway decent. Um, of course, that's Calvinist, but so is, let's see, where is another one that's not too bad? It's also Reformed, by the way. A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith by Robert L. Raymond. But this is just theology. Theology can't give you a relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't know any of this stuff. I barely knew any of the Bible when Christ saved me. See, a little child, and I wasn't a little child then, I was about 21 years old, but a little child can believe in Christ. Jesus Christ warned those, uh, warned people against causing one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, to be scandalized. In other words, to be ruined. Their faith to be ruined, like through atheism or theology or other things going to university, for example. Oh, the world is full of people. 
Where, where was I? I don't remember where I saw the stats, but most young people, most young Christians, self-identified Christians, that go to university lose their faith, at least temporarily. I think a lot of them come back. But they are blown up on the shores by the atheist professors. Who, and they're not, they're not old enough, and they haven't experienced enough. They're, they're raw meat coming out of high school. They have no real-life experience. They have not had to face anything at all, and they just... Now, when I went to university for a while, I had already been in the military, but the big difference was I was born again when I was there. Christ saved me when I was in the military. And that made all the difference, made all the difference. Because there in the military and every place else I've been since, that foundation, that rock, who is Jesus Christ, has been where my life is grounded. Am I a good disciple? No, I'm not. Am I a valuable disciple? No, I'm not. I am a worthless servant. Uh, but Christ purchased worthless servants. And it's not what I do, but what he does. What he does. I'm not pointing you to me. I'm pointing you to Christ. He's the one you need to know. All I can tell you about what he's done for this poor, worthless servant here that is, has all the riches of the world. I do. It all belongs to me. <laughs> and God blesses us in amazing ways. And, but part of that, you know, part of that blessing we experience when we recognize him and it's he that gives the stuff to. It's like, you know, I have a garden outside the garage here. It's I increased the size of it last year. I probably shouldn't have done that, but because even before that, it produced way more than we could possibly eat or give away. Way more. Why? The neighbors say, well, how come your garden grows so good? You put a lot of fertilizer on? No. How come this and how come how come when a tree falls down across the street? comes down right across, it smashes my neighbor's mailbox, but doesn't touch mine. Not, I'm not saying nothing ever happens bad, but I'm just saying in all those things, if you're looking and you know who you belong to, God watches out for his people. I've had some amazing things happen. I've had God start cars. I've had God enable a car to run that shouldn't possibly have been able to run for hundreds of miles. I've seen God heal people. I've seen tornado to hurricanes turn away multiple times because I prayed according to the will of God. It wasn't me. Anyone can do it. Just, just ask God according to his will. Of course, you have to know what his will is. You have to be speaking terms with him. You have to be a Christian. You have to be, you can't come before the throne of grace unless you're in Christ, in his atonement. You have that, who, everyone that belongs to Jesus Christ is a priest of God. We're a nation of priests. So let's, let me go over to the next passage I want to look at here. Talking about what the church is, what it's supposed to be. And I think a whole lot of atheists out there and agnostics and others, like this young woman I saw the other day, uh, Christy Burke, who was raised as a Southern Baptist and rejected that, probably went to university and ran into Calvinism too, and all of a sudden she's now a militant anti-Christian. Well, she never found, she never came to Christ. She doesn't know him. Before I go there, let me appeal to people like her and unbelievers, atheists, uh, agnostics, others. I would just ask you one thing. I, I know you don't believe the Bible. You think it's a bunch of nonsense. But you'll read a novel, won't you? You'll watch a movie, won't you? I would ask you to do one thing. Go to the Gospel of John and just read that. Don't 
worry about truth claims. Just read it as you would a novel. Since you don't believe what it says anyway. Just to treat it like you would any other book, as a novel. And then after you've read that, just imagine what kind of, about the main character in that story that's in the Gospel of uh, John, Jesus Christ. Is that, is, is the character in the Gospel of John, Jesus, someone you would like to know? Is he an interesting character? Is it an interesting story? Just treat it as if you were reading a short novel. Then ask yourself, you know, since is, is this man, Jesus Christ, a pretty amazing character? And then you can ex examine the evidence. The evidence is the resurrection. There's claims about the resurrection in this book. There were over 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection. The existence of Christianity itself, it's all built on the resurrection. The apostles went everywhere preaching Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That was the foundation. How do you account for the existence of what's called Christianity today, the largest religion in the world, over two and a half billion followers, even if they're nominal, they still hold to Jesus Christ. They still hold to believing in the resurrection. At least they hold, hold a religious view of these things. Not necessarily a personal, personal relationship, but they hold to this religion, which is far, far less than what we're really called to. Isn't that itself is evidence to something. It's like the people out there that say, well, Muhammad never existed. Well, the fact that Islam exists with one and a half billion followers, how could it come from nothing? Christianity exists because Jesus rose from the dead. That's the only thing that can possibly account for Christianity. And the fact that the apostles all died as martyrs except for John, and he was a torture. But they all died as martyrs believing this. Why would it, if they, if the story that the authorities put out, the narrative the authorities put out, which is still at present today, that his disciples came and stole the body away and pretended that he rose from the dead, why would they have done that? What would they have to gain? from that, because their lives were lives of suffering afterwards because of him. Why would they have gone through all that? And why would they have been put to death for trusting in him, regardless of what else? Why are there people today that are, will sacrifice everything for him? who claim to know him today, who are witnesses to his living presence today. Why? It's not just religion. It's more. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But it's, if you are willing to approach it even as you would approach a, a story or a movie and just look at the character of Jesus Christ, you'll see this is a pretty amazing person unless you approach it as just trying to tear it apart. So I just ask you to, to, to take it with a, even in on belief, just read it. Just read it in a, in a way that you would a, a novel. And then ask yourself what you think of the character that's called Jesus Christ. All right, so let's go to what the church is again. First Peter, is Peter an important apostle? I think so. You know that, that great big church building they put uh, that the popes built over in Rome there, to their own glory, by the way. 
It's all built to the glory of the papacy. It's a, just like Washington, D.C. I've been to Washington a couple times. I was not impressed. It's a city of, given over to idolatry, the idolatry of man. All these statues to dead people. I'm not really uh, upset about Antifa knocking them over, by the way. Uh, but they just put up statues to, to other dead people. So it's not really any difference. But the, the buildings... So, so you look at the—this at the, this is like the Vatican, too. You look at the Capitol building. Yeah, ever, well, you can't hardly get into these buildings now, but back then you could. This was before 9-11. So you go into the Capitol building, and you see the, the marble and all this stuff. You go and look in the, uh, the Senate or the House of Representatives, and uh, you see the, the Roman fasces up to the symbols of imperial power. Yeah, you use imperial symbols, you end up in imperial power. And that's like not, not a good thing to be in this world. And that's what the United States has become one of the most wicked countries on earth. Not because they're more morally wicked, it's because they got too much power and they use it in wicked ways. Selfish ways. The Houthis are more righteous than the United States. They're actually doing what international law requires them to do, and the United States punishes them for it. Weird. We live in a strange world. Strange world, indeed. Uh, but so, but the, uh, that whole edifice is built to impress people. It's, it's called, uh, what do they call that? Civil religion. And the monuments to Jefferson and and Lincoln and all these things and the the ones out in uh, South Dakota monuments idols idols to the national faith of civil religion that's often confused with Christianity and there is no connection at all no correct connection. You, you, Christianity as a civil religion goes back to the time of Constantine. Definitely. That was the origin of Christianity as a civil religion, as the harlot that rides the beast. Because the beast is government. Those are all kingdoms and kings that the beast, the woman, is committing fornication with. She is what? Old Testament, the harlot was Israel, uh, faithless Israel. So it's it's Christianity that is is doesn't belong to Christ, but who is actually a a rather than the bride of Christ, she's something else. She's a harlot, just like God spoke of, of Israel in the Old Testament. Same thing, same thing. And she dresses in purple and scarlet, sits on seven hills, and has a golden cup in her hand. And if that doesn't identify her, I don't know what could. Just go look at the Vatican, at, at the, not the Vatican, the, uh, all the churches, but especially St. Peter's. And all the wealth that was poured into that, extracted from the poor, ripping them off with the sale of worthless things called indulgences. It was a scam to the glory of the papacy. It's not the glory of Jesus Christ. It's the glory of the papacy. Just like Washington, Washington, D.C., it's all to the glory of the fathers and the system civil religion. Again, just not... See, uh, Constantine used Christianity as his civil religion. The United States sort of does that, but not officially. It uses Christianity, too. And there's a lot of harlots out there. There's a lot of ministers that are actually horrors out there that uh, commit fornication with the beast, too. The United States is pretty beasty right now. Always has been, really. 
You know, like that was just, just occurred to me. Yeah, actually, the United States is full partners in genocide with Israel in the Gaza. The United States engaged in all kinds of acts of genocide in this land with the Native Americans. And in some ways, the internment of the Japanese citizens in the United States, citizens of the United States that were of Japanese descent, was could be called an act of genocide too. Even if it's not, it was not actually murder. It was imprisonment, without charge and without crime. Putting them in ghettos in in. Well, they did the same thing with the, the Indians, putting them on reservations to get them out of the way and just like Gaza, let them starve and die, which has often resulted in rebellion and massacres in the United States, too. So let's go to Peter, First Peter, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. I remember Paul also talked about uh, new Christians as babes. The pure milk of the word, the words of the New Testament in particular. that by it you may grow in, reg in respect to salvation, if you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him, again, this is personal, to him, not to a church, not to a priest, not to a pastor, but to Christ himself, as to a living stone, Christ the chief cornerstone. He's referring to him. And in the Old Testament prophets, in Daniel, it talk, talks about a stone uh, cut without hands that destroys the image of Nebuchadnezzar, shatters it, turns it to dust. The image of the kingdoms of this world. Starting with the head of Babylon and then going down to the feet of iron and clay. As to a living stone rejected by men, yes, Christ is still rejected by most people, but choice and precious in the sight of God. So we're, we're coming to him as a, excuse me, coming to him as we are as living stones in this, rejected by men too, because he was rejected by men, so are we rejected by men, Christians because we are, he's in us. That's why we're rejected, because Christ is in us. If you're rejected because you're obnoxious, well, that's a different story. If you're rejected because you're evil, that's a different story. But if you're rejected because Christ is in you and they hate Christ, rejoice. As Jesus said, blessed are those. Rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God true about Christ and true about his people. And you also, as living stones, ah, see, I'm getting mixed up here. <laughs> Coming to him as to a living stone, that's Christ, rejected by men. And you also, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, we, those who belong to him, those who have come to Christ, are his temple. We are the temple of God. It's Paul says, also, going back to Genesis too. We are those who bear his image, and we will bear it much better when he glorifies our bodies. Right now, it's wrapped in clay. We've got this Adamic wrapper this thing we got for our natural birth, but inside, there's something else. There's Christ inside. Unfortunately, the outer wrapper often conceals that. <laughs> yeah, this outer wrapper, you could say, this is me. 
uh, as I was born into this world. And then there's the other inside, that is the new creation, that is of God, not of the flesh. Yeah, that makes us look like hypocrites a lot, I know it. But as Paul says, we end up doing things we don't want to do, and we end up not doing what we want to do because of this thing, which is only temporary, though. Not that we want to be unclothed, but we want to, our bodies to be redeemed. And we shall see that shortly when Christ returns. Can't be too far off now. This world, this world itself is on short time. It is running down. I see they got the atomic clock up to the the doomsday science um, thing of uh, atomic scientists up to like 15 seconds to the end or something like that now. I don't know. Why is that? Because they've got crazies. We, 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 not only do we have nuclear weapons, but now we have insane people in power. We do not have responsible people in power, people that realize the danger. We don't have people like that now. We've got neocons instead. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones being built up in, as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. That's what we're supposed to be. We are the priests, those who have come to Christ. We are the priests, not those things in the funny dress-like gowns. See, that was all stagecraft from paganism or the Old Testament. See, that's what Satan uses to deceive the world, saying that is Christianity. It's not. It is not genuine Christianity. It has shadows of Christianity. It has remnants of Christianity. But the vast majority is made by man. The vast majority, not God. Christians are made by God. You must be born again because you're born of the Spirit. That is the work of God. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What does Paul say our spiritual sacrifice is? Let me go over there right now. It's in Romans chapter 12. We beseech you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, those who have been born again are our brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That we should live for him. Off, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Thy will be done in me as thy will is done in heaven. Seeking his will rather than our own. And that's a conflict in us because we have these mortal bodies. We need to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to him. Lord, this is yours. Do with me as you please. Have you done that? We need to continue to do that because we can forget. Back to Peter. <sighs> For this is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief, a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. Again, according from the Old Testament, this is Jesus Christ. And he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. It's a relationship of trust in Christ. Christianity is a relationship of trust in Christ, not in an institution, not in men. 
but in our Savior, in our Lord, the God-man, who came and took on bodies like us and died on a cross for our sins and rose from the dead. The precious value then is for those, uh, for you who believe, but to those who disbelieve, a st the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And a, again, quoting from the Old Testament here, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, the word of Christ, the word of the gospel. And to this doom they were appointed. What? To who? To those who disbelieve. Not elected from eternity to that end. But those among men who believe, they inherit eternal life. That is the narrow way that leads to Christ. But those who disbelieve, who reject Christ, that's the broad way that leads to destruction. Yes, you, your belief, what you believe does matter. The scripture does not teach absolute determinism, not at all. If it was, if what they say is true, then man could never have been created to be the image of God. God could never have created it, actually, if you understand the, the system that they try to foist on you, which they themselves don't understand. Calvinists don't understand Calvinism. They don't. It's pretty arcane. It's pretty arcane. Uh, it's full of inconsistencies. You can't. It's. It claims to be logical, but it's not. It's not really. You just have to get down to the core. Once you find the core, then like, oh, this is bad. Uh, where was I? See, who is appointed to that doom? Those who disbelieve. It's a result of rejecting Christ. That's consistent testimony in the New Testament. Also, John in, in uh, John chapter 3, verse 36. Those who believe have eternal life. Those who disbelieve, the wrath of God abides on them because of their disbelief. Just I keep running into people, I find out, boy, Calvinism is as dangerous as I, thought, as I thought it was. It poisons people. It poisons people. And I think one of the reasons that, that God had me get in, into that for a while was so I could tell you it's dangerous. It poisons people. God does direct our ways. This is not the same as absolute determinism. <laughs> which makes God the cause of everything bad. Okay, where is the... I'm going to have to search for this. I don't want to dig around. First Peter 2.9. I had to get down a little... Yeah, I was right there. I didn't see it. But you are a chosen race or chosen generation. In other words, chosen offspring. Because that's what the word uh, race actually means, or generation actually means, the, uh, an offspring. And we often use it for, say, the next generation. But that, they're the offspring of us, for example. My children are my generation. They come forth, or they've come forth from me. Of, you know, so that's... It doesn't, it, when Jesus said, uh, in uh, this generation shall not pass away, he didn't mean a 40-year period. <laughs> That's not what he was talking about, I don't think. Uh, you have to understand, again, English can be a problem sometimes, especially when Satan is trying to deceive you, which he loves to do. He's a nuisance. 
you ever have a horse fly? You, ever get, you know what a horse fly is? You go for a walk and there's one of these flies and they bite and they're big flies. They're zzz, 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 zzz. That's what Satan's like. He's an annoyance. Well, then you gotta wait to, for him to land and you slap him good. You, you get him once in a while. He usually overplays his hand and that's when you realize who it is. Aha, caught you again. If you really want to stick it to him, just start praising God. Start thanking God for Christ and what he's done for you. <laughs> what Christ did on the cross, that'll stick him. Drive that stake through his heart. Yep, uh, remind him of that. <laughs> his greatest failure. You stupid devil, you crucified Jesus, and that did you in. You yeah, you 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 bit his heel, and he stomped your head. Uh, that's what happens. <laughs> We've got a serpent out there with a squashed head runner uh, crawling around with a couple fangs sticking out the side. Uh, uh, yeah, he. Uh, well, you know the fangs too. It's the serpent. It, those represent the power of death. Who has the keys of death now? <laughs> So actually, the fangs aren't sticking out of the serpent's head. Christ pulled them and sort of hung them on his belt as trophies. Yeah, the the keys of hell and death. In the book of Revelation, we see that uh, Christ has those, doesn't he? Took them away from somebody else. <laughs> they say he doesn't have them anymore. So you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. All those who belong to Christ, you've been born again. This is what you are. This is our identity, brothers and sisters. If you don't know Christ, this is the identity he calls you to. A, a royal priesthood, priesthood of David, of Judah, because Christ is of the tribe of Judah, the, the, the priesthood of uh, the order of Melchizedek. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. King James says peculiar, but that means uh, set us apart to him. Uh, this is the same word sanctification, too. We are God's own possession. We've been sanctified, set apart to him. That's what holy means, to be set apart to God. All those who belong to Christ are set apart to God, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, not of the Pope, not of the politicians, not of your denomination, not of the pastor or teachers out there, not my excellencies. I don't have any excellencies. Don't call me reverend. I hate that. Oh, that's so... That, that is so uh, that's so annoying when people, when people, Jesus said, don't be called rabbi, right? Because you're all brethren. I'm nothing more than that. Excellences of him that called you out of darkness into his light. Amen to that. I was called out of darkness. I can proclaim Christ crucified and risen from the dead and Christ the Savior because he called me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Definitely. I could go in court and testify to that. Oh, yes. For once you were not a people. Yeah, see, this is all, so, all this identity stuff. It disappears if you're in Christ. Why? Because you have an identity. And it's not what you were born with. It's what you're born again with. You once were not a people. But now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's who we are. That's what Christians are. We, we have eternal life because we belong to Christ. We know God because we have eternal life. I feel sorry for all these people, all these atheists and everything else, because a lot of this comes from seeing false religion, false Christianity, like Rome. 
and all the corruption in Rome, Babylon the Great, all the, the, the f just utter wickedness that's been exposed in the priesthoods of Rome over the last decades, after they could no longer cover it up anymore. And so much that is still covered up. There's supposedly a red bound book produced by Archbishop Vicino and some others for Pope Benedict about what the, the corruption in the Vatican. And it turned out to be not just financial, but a whole lot of sexual immorality. And, well, we know what that is there. Just utter corruption. And that is uh, perhaps one of the reasons he resigned. He just could not in a position to handle it. So what did they do? They, they picked somebody that would not expose them to be the next pope. Good old Frankie. The one who blesses these people. Yeah, let's bless all these on you. That was a Christmas gift for the, the staff in the Vatican. Yeah, well. Oh, you cardinal, you, you can all fornicate and do all these acts of, you know what, and we'll just have a blessing afterwards and we'll all bless one another. Oh, why not do it in the act? Let's roam. Let's roam. Rome has always been the system, the religion, the Vatican has always been corrupt, very corrupt. At times, they, it was actually a brothel, practically. But what's going on there now is worse. It's gone beyond that. Francis is beyond even the Borgia popes because he publicly seeks to destroy the remnants of Christianity in that system. I just pray for everyone who is a Roman Catholic. I have a heart for Roman Catholics. My in-laws were Roman Catholics. My wife was a Roman Catholic, but didn't know Christ. None of them knew Christ. As far as I know, none of them do. It's in Christ you find life. Not in that religious system. Not in that religious system. And so many Catholics, you know, you're Catholic in name only. You don't you don't attend mass every week. You you just this was your family religion, and this is what you were baptized into this thing, and that's what you belong to. You don't practice it. That's not a bad thing. What you need is Christ. You need a real relationship with him. I'm certainly not telling you to become a Protestant because they're just as bad. Most Protestants have no relationship with Christ either. It's what I grew up with. What I grew up with. It was just Catholic light. Living relationship with Jesus? No, I didn't have that. Didn't have that. You sin, you ask forgiveness. You sin, you ask forgiveness over and over and over again. At times, I had encounters with God, but I didn't know what to do with it. But God had a plan that was to save this wretched sinner. First, he showed me what I was. Oh, yeah, and I was indeed wretched, absolutely wretched. And then God showed me Christ. And I received him. I gave myself over to him. Lord, I'm yours. Do with me. <laughs> Have I been faithful to him? No, I haven't. Have I rejected him ever? No, I haven't. But have I been a faithful, obedient, uh, dutiful servant? No. No, I still have this body of flesh. But there's something new in me that never was there before. And it's been there since that day some 47 years ago. And that's Christ himself. And one of these days, I'm going to see him face to face. And I'm anxious for that day, to see him. I don't care about the streets of gold. I care about seeing the one who saved me, this wretched sinner. 
That's what the church is, people like me. People that have been saved out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't be satisfied for any, with anything else. Do not believe that anything less than that is Christianity, because it's not. Do not believe this massive institution that calls itself Roman Catholicism or any of the denominations that claim to be Christ. They put on a good display as far as stagecraft goes with all their stuff and their garments and their candles and their chanting and everything else. And some are lighter on that than others. But it's all, all that stuff is the work of men. That's man's religion that has been layered over the top, but was given to us by Jesus Christ and the apostles, which is a relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ, and nothing more than that. God does the work in you. You don't. You cannot make yourself into a Christian. Only God can. What you can do is when God calls, say, Yes, here I am. Save me. You can cry out to Christ to save you, but only he can do that. And he will save all that truly call upon him to be saved from what they are, from their sin, from their rebellion against God, from their darkness from themselves.